my soul rejoice take joy my king in what you hear let it be a sweet sweet sound in your ear I love Sunday of Easter. It's always good to see everyone from this view. I don't see you when I sit down there. So it's good to see everyone. In announcements this morning, please remember to take your bulletins home with you uh, because that's where the information is. Okay. Uh, in the bulletin, you'll notice the North Georgia Conference, the uh, general conference information. Uh, take that home and read it. If you have questions, please see Pastor Emmy. Um, that's for our information, and it's good information to have. Um, a thank you from the UMM. Yesterday was the yard sale, and all who participated and helped, those who donated or whatever, thank you, thank you, and the men, thank you. And it made pretty well. So, uh, there's a concert from for Emory. David um, will be participating in, I believe. Yes. Uh, and uh, you can see David if you want more information. So, it's this please. weekend. This next weekend. Yeah. Friday and Saturday, 8 p.m. at the Schwartz Center on Emory campus. It's an opera. There's about 180 voices with a full orchestra. And there are no tickets or no reservations or anything like that required. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be amazing. It should be amazing. If anybody wants to go and you need, if anybody would like to attend and you need transportation, because I know it's during the evening, um, just let me know. Um, I'm happy to take you and go and attend with you. Um, I don't have a big enough car, so we'll figure it out. But we'll find a way to get everybody who wants to attend to get. 
and so that we can support him. If you've never been to one of his concerts with the Emory Singers, they're pretty special. Um, well, I always leave feeling lifted up and when I attend, um, the only one I've had the opportunity to attend because he's been kind of secretive uh, about them has been the Advent, you know, the one going into Christmas season and it's always blessing and gotten me ready um, for that season in the life of the church. And so um, for me, this is just a bonus. Going to pull me through uh, finals. This is a little different, too. This yeah. is actually an opera. We're doing the Verdi Requiem. So it's, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Nelson finally last week admitted this is the biggest thing we've ever attempted. <laughs> it should be amazing. It will be amazing. Tomorrow is the food pantry from uh, 4 to 6. And we're going to touch on the mission auction uh, dinner for May 4th, but there's more information coming next week. So, um, and you'll need a tally for how many are uh, coming. So please, if you're coming, make arrangements to tell Mr. Walt uh, whether you will be here or not, please. And then, of course, the bulletin's important because on the back there's some information about mm, next month and, and June. So keep that in mind. Now, let's turn our whole being to worship, please. In our lectionary readings for today, John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. And then Psalm 23 happened to be the other part of the lectionary. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want is the first verse. Let us pray. O divine shepherd, restore our souls in this time of worship. Turn our minds into you so that we may gain an understanding of your will for us. Turn our hearts unto you, so we may abide in your love, that your love may flow through us. Turn our wills unto your word, so that you may guide us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 If you will, please stand for opening hymn, O for a Thousand Tongues, and remain for the <laughs> Apostles' Creed. believe. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's been a week of ups and downs, hasn't it? But it's all good. It's all good because God is so good, isn't he? He has walked every step this week with each of us. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit fills this place. And he is here and he wants us to worship with him. So let's do that. Each week I ask the question, where have you seen God at work this week? So, God was... Tremendous. Tremendous. Anybody else? I was going to say great, but tremendous. <laughs> tremendous kind of knocks it out of the park, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, kind of hard to beat that. But God is tremendous. I'm thankful for the good weather that we had yesterday for the men's group. The first year that I was here, they joked with me and said that was my responsibility. And I was like, oh, yeah, they're back there going, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I do. I start praying about good weather for that weekend. Um, and I was thankful because it wasn't overly hot. Um, it was warm. Um, but we had a great time. And so I am thankful for community. Um, and the time that we were able to spend together and the time that I was able to share um, with people in the community as well as with some people in our congregation. So that takes us to the second question. What are we thankful for? I've already told you what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for this church and for our community. What are you thankful for and what can you be thankful for that happened this week? For all the little details that I don't pay attention to sometimes, mm. I'm grateful that God keeps up with me. Yeah. Tells us not to fret the little things, right? The devil's in the details. He's got the big picture. Yeah. What else? God is faithful. He is faithful. He is. I'm grateful for family. I had a reunion yesterday, and I met some cousins that I haven't seen in 40 years. And that was great. Yeah, that's like great. putting you back like before COVID, right? Really. So yeah, it's always good to see to see family and friends, especially when we haven't been able to see them in a while. So as we prepare for our time for prayer this morning, I just want to remind you of a couple things. Last week we took a moment and we prayed over Jackie. Um, read as she prepares for surgery on Wednesday and I just ask that you continue to lift her up this week um, I will be joining them Wednesday morning um, at 530 at the hospital and I'll stay as long as Jerry wants me there um, I'm always here to serve you and so I, I want to make sure that you guys hear that you know a lot of times I get a call and I know you're busy but look I'm never too busy for this church family. Um, you guys are special to me. And I need you to hear that. I need you to know that. Um, that's why I always give David a hard time about not telling us about his concert. So I was, I was really glad when that email came through. So yeah, I was really happy that we were able to get it in the bulletin today so I wouldn't forget. I also want to remind you that the altar is open. It's open throughout the service. It's not just now. 
Um, if at any time you feel led or compelled to come to the altar, it's yours. This is your time with our God. And I say our God because he belongs to all of us because we are his children. But our relationship with him is special. And this is a time that we set aside to be with him. So let us pray. As we gather before you today, we come with hearts open to receive your word and your truth. We are reminded of the profound, lo the profound love that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the ultimate act of love and his sacrifice. And it serves as the foundation of our faith and the guiding light for our lives. Father, we confess that we often fall short in our practice of love. We acknowledge the times when our hearts have been closed to those in need and when we have failed to extend compassion and care to those around us. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our, sh of our, for our shortcomings and help us to grow in our capacity to love one another as you loved us. Grant us, God, the courage to examine our hearts honestly and root out any traces of hatred or indifference within us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be empowered to love not only in word and speech, but also in deed and in truth. God, help us to embody your love in practical, tangible ways reaching out to those in need and offering comfort and care to the hurting and to the marginalized. Lord, we lift up to you all of those who are in need of your love and compassion today. We pray for the brokenhearted, the oppressed, and the marginalized. May your love surround them like a warm embrace, bringing healing, hope, and restoration in their lives. God, today we lift up Jackie Reed. Doris Bell. Marty Lawrence. Earl O'Dell. Sylvia Cabs. The Bartlett family. Lauren Neathammer. Finally, Lord, we ask for your guidance and strength as we seek to grow in our practice of love. Help us to follow the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, who showed us what it means to love sacrificially and selflessly. May our lives be a reflection of your love, shining brightly in a world that desperately needs your grace and your mercy. We offer up this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and resurrected Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> There's a rose in Bethlehem, colored red, like mercy's blood. It's the flower of our faith. It's the blossom of God's love. Though its bloom is fresh with youth, surely what will be he knows, for a tear of morning dew is rolling down the rose. O oh, rose of Bethlehem, how lovely, pure, and sweet, born to glorify the Father, born to wear the thorns for me. Wisdom and all the ways of man. 
Well, good morning. This week on social media, I came across a post about Walt Disney. Maybe some of you have already seen it or are familiar with the unofficial hug rule for characters. I was not, but I'm not surprised at what I learned. There's an unofficial rule for characters that work in the parks. They never let go of a child's hug first. They allow the child to hug as long or as short as they want. Now I understand that in today's world that might creep out some parents. But I want you to think about it from the child's perspective. They're seeing somebody leap off of the screen and come to life before their very eyes. It's someone who helps them imagine and dream. However, this simple yet powerful rule underscores the significance of offering physical comfort and care to others, mirroring the selfless love exemplified by Christ. Just a hug from a Disney cast member can brighten a child's day. Our acts of material care and compassion can bring hope and healing to those around us. Our scripture lesson today comes from oh, comes from 1 John 3. It'll, we'll look at verses 16 through 24. Let us hear the word of God. We know, love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him. However, whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey this commandment abide in him and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. This week's text can be broken into two sections. The first is verses 11 through 17. It defines the sort of love that Christians should have for their brothers and sisters in Christ. The second half of the scripture, verses 18 through 24, give us some assurance in the midst of our shortcomings in love as well as help us to understand the link between belief and love. John begins this section by declaring that this command to love is what we have heard from the very beginning. This statement from the beginning makes us look back to the opening line of the epistle where John declares what was from the beginning was a person of Jesus Christ. This message of love, then, is tied tightly to the work and the person of Jesus. John may be referring to Jesus' words 
in the gospel. In John 13, 34, he says, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As such, the command to love spoken of here is really nothing new, is it? What is the nature of this love that we have been commanded to show and to whom should we give it? Most commentators believe that John is referring to the love of one's Christian brothers and sisters. Love for one's neighbor, as Jesus defined for us in his parable, the Good Samaritan, must begin with the love of one's fellow Christian. The community of faith is a place where we learn and where we practice the love that we are called to have out in the world. Without loving our Christian brother and sister first, it will be impossible for us to share the love that we have received with the world. As John has done throughout the letter, he compares and contrasts a negative example of love with a positive one. He begins first with the negative in the form of an admonishment. We are not to be like Cain. And if you're not familiar with Cain, Cain killed his brother Abel. John claims that Cain was from the evil one. This is not to discount Cain's personal responsibility in the matter that he murdered his brother, rest assured. But really, it's to display that those who engage in murder and even hate are still under the influence in the realm of evil and death. The realm, John says, that we have been freed from because of Jesus Christ. In verse 14, that verse can be taken the wrong way if we're not careful. John doesn't assert that love is how we cross over from death to life, but instead that love is the re result of our being freed from the power of death. Listen to that again. John does not assert that the love that love is how we cross over from death to life, but rather that love is the result of our being freed from the power of death. The proof that a person possesses eternal life is displayed through expressions of love for one's brothers and sisters. Love expressed is concrete. It's a concrete action for others and it's evident in our Christian faith. If love is the evidence of Christian faith and love, then hate and murder that springs from it is the evidence of lack of faith. Most, if not all of us, are not or will not become murder murderers, thank goodness, right? I would hate to think that whatever percentage of us would, would fall into that. John's description, however, should not fail to convict us and call us to examine our inner thoughts. Our inner thoughts towards our Christian brothers and sisters, not to mention the world at large. Something as simple as hate can derail our Christian faith. Hatred is the wish that another person was not there. It is the denial of a person's right to live in full connection within a community. Nowhere has hatred been expressed more by Christians than that, than on social media. Our posts in support of this cause or that cause or our posts in opposition to this or that movement often reveal to us and the world around us 
just how much hate lives in our hearts. It's really easy to hide behind a screen. You may not realize that because many of you may or may not post on social media, but you have children and grandchildren who do. Those who hate, John says, do not have eternal life abiding in them. He draws that from the saying of Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 and in other places. Those who hate do not have eternal life abiding in heaven. John now moves to a more positive image of love, the one that makes us feel a little bit better. He goes straight to Jesus and his actions for the best and clearest picture of love. We know what love is because Jesus, in love, laid down his life for us. And it's not just that Jesus sacrificed himself for us, but that in Jesus' de death, he said no to his own life. He said no to his own life so that we can live, so that we can see that there's life beyond death. It was for our benefit. There was nothing beneficial for Jesus in that moment on the cross, was there? But when he rose and showed us there was another way, he did that for us, for you and for me. He showed us that it was for, <coughs> for our benefit. <coughs> Love that does not work for the benefit of the other. It's not love. What Jesus has done for us, the love that we have experienced through Jesus is something we ought to share with others. This is more than a mere telling of the love of God through Christ. This is concrete. It's a lived out expression of love for the other. It is a self-sacrifice for the benefit of another no doubt, due to the nature of Jesus' sacrifice for us that resulted in his death, we will champion the kind of love that actually leads to literally give up one's life in martyrdom. For us, this might not be a close reality, but for others it is. Here in the United States, or in most, develop, most of the developed world, we don't have to worry about being a martyr for our faith. But at some point, we might be asked to lay down our life for our Christian brother or sister. But I'm going to tell you, that's not really what John had in mind in this part of the scripture. The last verse in, sec in this section, verse 17, displays John's intention. And that intention is much more mundane than dying as a sacrifice. The love that is expressed in laying down one's life for another person is love that sacrifices one materials, one's material goods, time, and money so that another might have the joy of living. We see that when we give of our time selfishly with nothing in return. This isn't about good deeds. That's not what we believe as Methodists. This is about just basic human decency. When we bring food from our pantry to share with the food pantry, we fill up the pantry of somebody who doesn't have anything. When we serve the food pantry, we serve the community. 
we see it firsthand. When we go and we serve good news at noon, we see those that don't have shelter. We know because when we leave, they're literally setting up a tent or a makeshift tent across the street. Here, John speaks of love that is displayed through compassion and mercy for those who do not have adequate means of caring for themselves. And we do that well as a church. The NRSV phrase, yet refuses to help, falls, fails to communicate the true nature of what John is expressing the NIV version says, but has no pity. It's a little bit better, but it still kind of misses the mark. What these two translations render as refuses or no pity comes from the Greek phrase that means to close the bowels. The intestines were regarded as the seat of emotion and compassion when Jesus walked the earth. The intestines were regarded as the seat of those emotions. And when we close off one's intestines or when we close off our intestines, it means we do it as a shield. We do it to shield our inner self from the suffering and want that takes place around us. The language is active in nature. This intentionally shields us from the very real physical reaction that takes place when we see someone in need and we refuse to help. Or maybe we don't take the time. Do you have that one opportunity where you were like, if I could go back and redo that one moment and make a difference in someone's life? Man. I missed the mark on that. Do you have a moment like that? Do you have a memory like that? It's in those moments. It's a conscious choice. The image is vivid and it describes something that we all almost certainly have felt. We have seen great and small human need and felt that knot in our stomach. That not, it's this word called compassion. Yet at some time or another, we have all shut off our minds and our feelings and we've gone on our own way. And we've learned to shut off that vow of compassion. John's point is that Christian love is love which gives those in need so that, and so long as we all have it. Hold on. Christian love is love which gives those in need while our brothers and sisters have little or nothing and we do nothing to help them. We are lacking in love which is essential evidence that we are truly children of God. John concludes this section with another admonish, ad, I can't say this word this morning. He slaps us on the wrist. And based on his argument to this point, to love, not just in speech and in word, but also in truth of love expressed through action. The question that John poses in verse 17 should stop to give us pause. We can have love of God truly remain in someone if they choose to turn from the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ, can't we? While it's true that John is speaking about the love of the, that the members of the community of faith have for one another, this community is the place where we practice our love 
for the world at large. If we can't love one another in these four walls, how in the world are we expected to go out and love people in a community or love people that we don't even know? If we cannot seriously take care of one another, we will not be able to exercise our love for the world. And if we can't exercise our love for the world, then we fail. We fail to be the body of Christ. The physical hand and feet of God in our world. What's at stake here is more than just the nature of our own community of faith and how we might love and live together. It is the very nature of our witness to the larger world. If we are to take seriously the call to bear witness to the kingdom of God, then we must intentionally and tangibly express our love for our Christian brothers and sisters so that we can better express our love to those in need in our community. I'm happy to say this church does an exceptional job of loving one another. We have food trains. We have people calling and just touching, point, touching base and checking on one another to make sure that everything is okay. You guys are on autopilot. I joke, I'm usually the last one to know about anything that's going on in the life of the church because you guys handle it so beautifully. So my question is, how do we take the next step? If we come here to fill up, how do we go out and where do we go to pour out all the love that we receive when we're here? Because that's what we should be doing. We should go out into the world and pour all of our love out and let it just exude from us. And then we should come back here and refill this is a hospital for our spirit so that we can feel alive and learn to love and replenish. I always tell my friends, there's a time where we sit in the pews to recharge. And there's a time when we go out into the world to give fully. We take our tank full from here and we go out and we run it right until we get down to about an eighth, eighth of a tank. And then we should be able to come back and refill again. What are you doing to make sure that your tank isn't always sitting on full? How are you reaching out into the community or family members that don't sit here in this house? with us in the church and if you're on empty what are you doing to refill and recharge your batteries it's an important lesson you've got to refill so that you can pour out if you pour out when you're empty there's not a whole lot there and God's light can't shine very brightly so I hope that you will always come here to refuel and that when you step outside that door and you step into the Walmart or the Costco and do your grocery shopping or when you go out and you are at the boat docks or driving a school bus or just loving on your neighbor, you have plenty of fuel to pour out into the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'll stand and sing.
beginning of our time today, I shared the story from Walt Disney, the unwritten rule of a hug. How will you live into that when you go out into the community? Is there a way that we can do that without being weird? I think so. But I think COVID stole so much of our touch. I was thinking about that this week when I read that story. I was like, dang it. We still haven't recovered from hugs and being able to give hugs freely. COVID took that touch away. And as people, we are meant to be touched and held and felt. So when you go visit someone who's lonely, maybe you offer to hold their hand for a moment when you pray. Or maybe when you're at the dinner table and you have and are breaking bread with somebody, maybe you take a moment and you hold their hand just in that moment. That's one way that we can pour out into our community. Just a simple act of touch. We've got to get back to it. COVID stole so many things, but that is something that we can reclaim. So go out into the world. Find a way to give that hug to somebody who might be in need. Amen. Thank you.